Lots of magicians hate me. They don't know me from the tricks I've created. They know me from Facebook and they hate me because they think I'm doing stupid magic tricks. They think the magic tricks are stupid because they can figure the tricks out. But I'm not performing for other magicians. I'm performing for billions of people out there. I want you to know that Las Vegas wasn't my idea. If I could have picked the magic capital of the world, it would have been Portland, Oregon, or Austin, Texas, or anywhere else. I don't know what it means for our culture that magic has become synonymous with Las Vegas, but I am pretty sure it means something. A lot of the people I really admire, a lot of my friends, you know, live here and work here and perform every night, but when I think of magic, I think of wonder and astonishment, and this is not that. Maybe that's not fair. Maybe I'm just missing it. Anyway, welcome to Las Vegas. What's the magic scene like in Las Vegas? I mean, I know there are a lot of magicians here, and I don't have that in Iowa. I'm, I mean, You're I'm, the one. I'm the, I'm the magician there, yeah. You're it. So what's it like to live in a town that's, that's filled with magicians? It's great. I, uh, I feel bad that you're not here. And if you were to spend more time here, you would feel bad about it too. It's wonderful. <laughs> Las Vegas is the best place to develop new magic material. It's the best place to test it out. It's inexpensive to live here. We have the best magic shows in the world. Las Vegas is the magic capital of the world for good reason. This is Rick Lax. In the world of magicians, he's been well known for years as a prolific inventor of original magic. But recently, he shot to internet superstardom with a series of interactive magic videos that have been watched over two billion times. Two billion views. What's that like? It's surreal. The number's so big, uh, I can't feel a difference between a hundred million and two billion. What does that, what does that do to somebody? I mean, how, how is that? That, that's like a wrecking ball smashing into someone's life. Yeah, uh, twice I got free tacos at Chipotle. <laughs> uh, one of the times it was with guacamole. Okay. And even as we've been talking, I've gotten at least one death threat, maybe as many as five. I've gotten probably a hundred pieces of hate mail, whether directed at me or left as a comment on my videos. There hasn't been a specific comment or death threat that's really uh, bothered me, but there is something existentially weird about knowing that so many people are hating you or wishing you harm. That's a hard thing to wrap your head around. Your, your Facebook videos and your invention seem like two very different projects. When I do the Facebook videos, I'm not uh, setting out to make great art. Hmm. I mean, what, what, what are you going for? What is the, what is the vision? Mm. When I started making the Facebook videos, I didn't set out to do interactive magic. I was doing videos like everyone else. Street magic, maybe we'll call it. Uh, straight to camera magic. Right. And then, 20 videos in, I did an interactive trick that I created. Uh, and this is where I read the mind of the person watching the video. And before then, my videos were getting 20,000 views, 30,000 views. And then this one got 13 million. And so all of a sudden, I'm like, I'm going to be the interactive magic guy. Right. But after 10, I was like, oh crap, now I'm the interactive magic guy and I'm out of interactive tricks. So I had to start thinking up my own. Right. And then I did that for a year. Talk to me about what those work days looked like. Like, you know, you, you record in a Starbucks, but I'm, I'm assuming there's a tremendous amount of brainstorming and trial and error that goes, I mean, just like any magic before you take it to the stage. Yeah, uh, and the trial and error early on, it would happen on Facebook where I'd say, I think I've got a good idea for a trick and I would make a video of it and I would upload it 
And then within the first five minutes, I could tell people didn't like it. So either they would put in the comments, this is stupid, or they'd say it's not working, or they wouldn't share the video. So I would just delete the video and make a new one. Some, some days I, I was so driven, I would spend five hours just making a video. It would fail in five minutes. I could tell it was gonna go poorly. Right. Uh, and then I would start again, just do another video that day. Some days I did three videos like that. And some of my best videos, uh, best in terms of numbers of people who watched, came from those days where I would just make a video, fail, do it again, fail, then make another video. Third one would hit. Did you, did you start doing magic as a kid? Some of my first memories are going over to my grandmother, grandfather's house. Some of my first memories are going over uh, to my grandparents' house and they, you know what, air that, there, I just corrected myself, because, and then, I, in my mind, I'm like, wait, he's going to edit, edit this, out, right. but I think it's more interesting to people, so you get a sense of what it's like to be an entertainer. Everything you see everywhere is fake, so when I started to answer that, I wasn't saying grandparents, I started to say grandmother, then in my head, I'm like, oh, and you have to say grandfather, then in my head, I'm like, why are, why are you drawing that up? Right. There's a phrase for that, grandparents, just start over. so okay. I shut up, and then I start over, which is what you do when you're on TV. <laughs> But I think more interesting, leave that in so people can get it. And that happens with every, anytime you see anyone say anything on EGT, it's the ninth version after the producer has said, just say grandparents. So, so this made the edit. Uh, some of my first memories uh, are going over to my grandparents' house and my grandparents had the best collection, VHS collection of David Copperfield tapes. They had lots of other tapes too, but this is the one thing that we could agree on, where I liked watching it, my grandparents liked watching it, and we would watch the Copperfield specials again and again, and these are my first memories, yeah. right? And I could see how affected my grandmother was uh, by this magic, where she was pained, she'd say, oh, Ricky, how, does, how did he do that? How is that happening? She was like pained in a, a good way, a clump, we, we might uh, say. So in the back of my head somewhere, I could see the end result of good magic. Right. I knew if you do a really good magic trick, you can make people react like this. For you, what's one thing that comes to mind if you did a trick for someone and it really cut through? I mean, my favorite reactions are, you know, I think everybody loves that thing where you do magic and people start screaming and running away. My favorite thing is when they don't do that, when they just stand there in this still, silent awe, you know, and you can, yeah. you can just tell. It's a look that, that is, you don't see on people's faces anywhere else. We're all sort of performing for each other all the time, mm -hmm. right? Down to the clothes we wear, the words we choose, the way we communicate. We're all sort of putting off the Not air me, that we want. just naturally... Uh, <laughs> uh, me, I wear a watch in everyday life. No, that's a good point. I do not, uh, the kind of what you're getting at, like, right. because I know we're gonna chat on camera, I put right. on a fancy watch right. uh, and a fancy shirt before this wasn't but, wearing but, it. But this is not just you, like everybody does that. Yeah. And one of the great things about magic is that it makes all that go away for a second. Mm -hmm. Something amazing happens and no one's pretending anything anymore. Like they're just, they're right there in the moment, you know? I love that.